Good morning. This is Yvonne Curtis, Chair of the Best Practice and Student Transition Subcommittee of the Oregon Education Investment Board. I'm going to open our meeting for uh, today, January 13th. We do not yet have a quorum, but we believe we know for sure one of the members on the way, and we believe there's another one on the way as well, struggling with finding parking. We have a long agenda, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We will skip the items that need approval of the committee until we have a quorum. Um, the one thing I will just mention so I don't forget is uh, I did not get a chance to give my edits to uh, Hilda until this morning. So those will already be there for the draft um, minutes from last time. I also want to rem remind everybody here that we are being streamed because others are very interested in the conversations, uh, specifically today's conversations. So just want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, I want to point the committee to our uh, tracking sheet, we're calling it. Um, thank you, Hilda, for building this and for putting it together. I think it's a great way of holding ourselves accountable to make sure that when we invite topics and people to have conversations with us, we are not just having conversations. We really want to move forward. We want to take out barriers. We want to ensure that our students, uh, that we're serving more and more students in a better way every day and this will help us keep track of that. I will also use that to identify what we do share with OEIB each month about what is the progress uh, of this committee. Um, I, we have highlighted in yellow um, areas that we have either approved or need to approve. Last time we talked about the Smarter Balance results and using them as an alternative to placement uh, exams uh, for students entering higher education. Uh, it looks like, according to our sheet, the next time this will be on the agenda will be in spring. So we did uh, support the idea of moving forward with this concept, but they'll be coming back to us with um, a report on the technical implementation, what the technical implementation work group is working on and their progress at that point and what we'll be ready to implement. Is there anything else, Hilda, on this one that we want to call out? Uh, you might want to do this one. Okay. Uh, so Oregon requires high school students complete an education plan and profile. We had a report last time about that. The next steps were we requested a study of schools where best practices and affiliated outcomes could be documented and shared. Uh, Peter Tromba is working on that and will come back to us in spring. We wanted to also make sure that students, educators, and families had easy and access to accurate and useful information on career and college planning. We requested a clearer picture on what steps, programs, tools, and intervention schools use to promote a career and college going culture and what barriers exist currently in providing equitable access for students, their families, and educators. And on this one, um, we, uh, I sort of, drafted some language here and don't want to put this in your words so you need to really think about what you want to do as a result of learning what those pieces are do you want to consider some kind of a coordinated campaign communication messaging um, I think one of the things is that we heard last month that there were a lot of uh, unevenness across places in our state about how students find information, how families get information, and once we get a better picture of that, you will probably, I don't know if you want to um, suggest a coordinated campaign or something else, so I was missing a word there. So I feel like first we need to gather the information and then have that conversation. It would be nice if OEIB staff, and you can weigh in, David, might even give us a recommendation ar around what that campaign would look like so that it connects to all of the work that we're doing and doesn't feel like another sort of isolated pathway. David, did you want to Yeah, that? I agree. Find out more what's, what's going on out there and also how this relates to the proposal for a portal. There's some kind of portal they're talking about that students statewide can go to. I think just to have all that in front of us would help to do this out there. Thank does that you. give you yep, the guidance it you does. need? All right. Thank you. Anything else, David? Any comments about this chart? Does, is this helpful to you? It is helpful. Okay. 
Any other suggestions you might offer for it? Not right off. Okay. okay. We will come back to it each meeting, and if we have time at the end of the meeting, we'll sort of summarize and make sure. Otherwise, we'll depend on Hilda to get the information there as we move through each agenda item. So we'll move to 5.0 on the agenda, which is a report on the HEC Student Success and Interinstitutional Collaboration Subcommittee. Are we trying to see how many big words we can put So the time? intent of this item is that uh, we see that both OEIB and this best practices uh, and student transition subcommittee and the HEC, particularly the subcommittee that it has such a long name, uh, are focused on some very parallel pieces of, of work. And although the staff often inter interact, uh, Salam and I meet weekly, um, we all kind of are sharing. We wanted to make sure that uh, just like they got a, a, their committee got an update from us last week, mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure this committee gets an update from HEC. Okay. And Welcome, Salam Noor and Elizabeth Cox Brandt. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Would Thanks you like us to follow the sequence on the agenda, or I'm willing to offer my colleague to go first oh, if you wish free. to go first? Feel free. Feel free. Okay. Right. Uh, are we going to be able to hear them? Is that possible? Thank well, you for letting us know you couldn't hear. We'll adjust that. And for the record, state your names. Okay. All right. Like close to you. Yeah, just make sure. All right. All right. Uh, good morning for the record. Salam Noor, Higher Education Coordinating Commission. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some information with you relative to the work of the Student Success and Interinstitutional Collaboration Subcommittee of the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Uh, Chair Neil Bryant had, had uh, regrets not being able to present to you in person, and he asked that uh, I and my colleague, Shali Hodgson, who's traveling today and is not able to join me, uh, come and share some information with you. Good morning, Shali. So uh, we're delighted to, uh, to share with you uh, some highlights of the work that the subcommittee has been engaged in. And as I look at the name of your subcommittee relative to student transitions, the Student Success and Interinstitutional Collaboration Subcommittee works almost exclusively on student transition issues. Uh, as you can see from their long list of accomplishments, uh, the committee focuses uh, a lot on areas that help facilitate transition from high school to community colleges, universities, and also facilitate transition between community colleges and universities. So their work is primarily about pathways, it's about alignment, it's about artic articulation, it's about removing barriers that get in the way of student entering college, and most importantly, succeeding and completeing college. Uh, the, the subcommittee, as you can see, has handled a lot of um, components, foundational components of higher education, if, if you will, in our state. They adopted dual credit standards. They are working on the redesign of the Oregon Opportunity Grant to increase access to students and to ensure uh, their retention and success in college. Uh, they're looking at new student pathways, such as the new math pathways. Uh, establishing different pathways for students that are di that are interested in different career opportunities and how math actually fits into that. Uh, they've worked on the Associate of Science Oregon Transfer Computer Science degree that was adopted by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission last month, I believe, and that expands the opportunities that are available to students for transfer from community colleges to universities. Keep in mind that many of these opportunities translate into pathways from the secondary to the post-secondary level. Can I ask a question Absolutely. about that? So mm -hmm. computer science, um, th does that mean that it would start in high school and that there are some sh shared courses? Potentially okay. under dual credit. So right. currently we have the, the main uh, mode of uh, transfer, if you will, between community colleges and universities is the AAOT, the Associate of Art Oregon Transfer Degree. And what we're exploring is different, more specialized pathways to accommodate student interests, such as in computer science, in business, in marketing. Uh, one of the things that we may potentially explore is an Associate of, Art of Science um, STEM-related kind of pathways as well. So what we're looking to do is diversify the pathways that are available to students. So for those that want to transfer uh, and, and uh, uh, achieve junior status at a university, 
uh, but haven't really determined what particular major they're going to go into, the AOT is ideal. For somebody that's interested in, in a math concentration that wants to be in, in engineering or science, etc., uh, a more concentration on math and science and that transfer degree might be more suitable. So we're just exploring the different options and opportunities, and this is the subcommittee that we bring those items to, to understand, uh, so, so we all understand the implications, the opportunities, and to get direction and guidance from before those things go to the HEC, to the full commission. Great. Thank you. Uh, this subcommittee also studied some really innovative practices such as pay it forward, free community college, textbook affordability, and credit for prior learning. In the interest of time, Helda advised me, she said I had three minutes. I think I've used oh. up all my three minutes. So. <laughs> we'll give you a little more. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so in the interest of time, Hilda asked me to focus perhaps on a couple of examples of the work that this committee has been engaged in relative to pathways and, and really relative to uh, student success and transition. One is the credit for prior learning. Uh, Donna Llewellyn in, in, our, um, in the Higher Education Coordinating Commission has been working with a task force as has been directed by House Bill 4059 that was passed in the 2012 session. Uh, to create an advisory committee for credit for prior learning. And the whole purpose behind credit for prior learning is really to consider the diversity of students that come to our institutions and to take into consideration the different learning and the different experiences that they've been engaged in. Some may have attended college uh, at some point in their career, left, pursued a career, came back, and we want to be able to give them credit for that, for, for what they've done in the past and also the, the life learning that they've been engaged in. Uh, an ideal example of that are students that are coming out of the military. They have uh, phenomenal training and it would be wonderful to look at their experience and afford them some credit. Uh, that they can use to pursue a higher education. We also find that students uh, that come into the university system or the community college system for that matter with some credit uh, have an, uh, demonstrate higher persistence rates and completion at the community college and the university level. So the primary purpose of this, of this committee is to, is to really look at systems and look at mechanisms for granting credit for prior learning in our institutions in a consistent and reliable manner. So we want to look at credit for prior learning requ uh, requ requisites evidence-based types of assessments, tuition and fee structure associated with that, transferability and, trans, uh, and transcription. Uh, we want to look at data collection to understand the impact on the institution. So if we're granting credit based on prior learning, is there a financial impact on the institution that's issuing that credit? Uh, we want to look at faculty and staff development because we want to have consistent practices throughout the state and quality assurance in response to House Bill 4059. Uh, primarily, we're looking at transparency and access. So uh, we want to devise mechanisms that serve the student and support them in, in their pursuit of higher education. Uh, we actually have several institutions participating in this process. We have 11 that have volunteered to be pilot sites, and they're both private and public sector uh, uh, institutions, community colleges, and universities, and we'd be happy to update you on that uh, at a future date. The other project... Just one second. Yes, Hilda, you had a question you wanted to ask? Given the focus of today's conversation around uh, approaches around personalized and proficiency-based learning for K-12 students, I am curious to what degree do you think this work of credit for prior learning that's happening in the post-secondary realm creates sort of an on-ramp of understanding at least about um, students earning credit from prior experience through somewhat of a proficiency right. review right. process. Yeah, I, I thank you for the question, Elda, and I think it's a, it's a really great question, and it touches on this other project that I want to share with you that's still in its, in, its infancy stages, but the, the highlight of this is really proficiency-based learning. So students will, will need to demonstrate proficiency through some clearly defined assessments and agreed upon assessments to, to uh, measure their proficiency and mastery of a certain set of knowledge and skills. So it continue, it really furthers the proficiency work that we're engaged in. Uh, and that work is, is really complicated because it can vary dramatically from one institution to another. I know in our school districts, the 197 school districts, we have proficiencies in a variety of ways. I can't, I don't know if it's, if it's 
I know for a fact that it's not the same definition, if you will, but, it, but it's something that we have a lot of interest in, we have a lot of uh, best practices, and I think this furthers that work. Great. Okay. So the other project that we're working on is a passport uh, initiative project, and actually it's a WICHI product, uh, project, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. And it, it dovetails really well with the work that we've done as a state around AAOT. So AAOT has a list of courses and proficiencies that students complete, and based on that they transfer to a university and they uh, maintain junior status once once they get there. My son actually, I have first-hand experience in that. My son completed his AAOT at Chemeketa Community College and he's a junior at Oregon State. The the passport initiative is is a partnership of the of the Wichi states and participating uh, partner institutions here in Oregon. Currently we have one community college that has agreed to participate. Morning Mark and uh, we're in the process of, of uh, consulting with Western Oregon University and Southern Oregon University to gauge their interest. And if we can get both on board, we can actually launch this project. And this project is, is really about learning outcomes. So faculty come together, they identify the learning outcomes, again, proficiencies that we want students to meet, and they agree on the assessments. And based on that, students would be able to transfer to any of the participating institutions and all of their credits would be accepted. So it's very similar to the AAOT. I think it takes it a step further because it's not course-based, it's really outcomes-based. And it furthers the proficiency work that we want to do as a state. So Can I ask a question? Yes, to absolutely. what extent might it be joined to Eastern Promise and replication type <laughs> places? Is there an interest in doing that, or is this a completely separate project? Well, it's. Uh, I, I think I look at these projects as opportunities to learn, if you will. So in terms of direct linkages, um, it might be a stretch to say that um, I mean, the only way I, th I think we could have a direct linkage is if Eastern Oregon University was a participating institution, mm. uh, but they are not. Blue Mountain Community College, however, will be a participating institution if the project actually launches, and that is a direct link to the Eastern Promise. However, sense. there is indirect linkages here in terms of what we learn from these projects. So this is proficiency-based that looks at a core set of knowledge and skills in particular subject areas. <coughs> and once the student transfers, they will be articulated into credits. We're having concerns oh. that it's hard to hear you on the phone. Sorry. <coughs> Yeah, maybe you can clarify a little. I'm not quite sure what, it, what this means. Is it because <coughs> the current system you could transfer credits from the right. institutions yeah. provide their acceptance? So yeah. how is this different? Yeah, so that's really a, a good question, and uh, that was the next point that I was going to touch on, and it deals with what's often referred to as the leakage of credits between community colleges and universities. So students transfer, but quite often some of their credits don't get accepted because the, the receiving university wants the student to participate in their own courses that are major specific. Keep in mind that these are transfer students, junior level students. Uh, this, once you identify the proficiencies, we get past the courses, so we stop, we stop debating whether it's the right course or not. We stop debating whether it's the right course number or not, or the right course um, label, name or not. <laughs> it's about proficiencies. And once we have agreement from these participating institutions, those proficiencies are accepted and the student, the, they translate to the actual courses at the receiving institution. So it's really designed to address... <laughs> I did not do that. <laughs> we have two issues here. We have a. <laughs> we have two wow. issues we were dealing with. If you could hear, there was a phone yeah. sound yes. in the background. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we had concerns that even people in the room, maybe we should have you pull around so that you're facing this way, but they okay. could not hear you even in the room. So I'm just concerned okay. about how we can project. Right. Hold on for one second. There's something going on. With that. There is, obviously. <laughs> OK. Okay. Do you want to shift over to your I, facing I'm more than way? happy to do that. Okay. Do I have to start over again? No. OK. No. <laughs> I know it's frustrating for the audience if you can't hear. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sure. She's my own speech teacher voice. And these don't pull any closer to you. I will lean towards them. Great. Thank you.
we've had a lot of meetings in this room. We've never had that happen. No. I'm going to own it, Hilda. My power went out this morning. My dead end meeting last week had to get, re get moved because of a leaky. So, I mean, I just <laughs> tell you, Jessica, I'm jinxed. So I can't I'm print at the <laughs> office <laughs> right <laughs> now. <laughs> it shows that the theme starting at 530 in Dallas. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> Okay, we'll be watching to see if it happens sorry. every time you come. Sorry. <laughs> it was a hard... It's a hard night. <laughs> it was. Well, I know Seth asked us to wait, but let's see if we could go forward and if uh, the group can hear Salam. Let's try it. Okay. <laughs> you remember where you left off? <laughs> yes, I think I left off with the leakage concept. Yep. So, which is something that really uh, affects the transfer of students from community colleges to universities. So the more we tighten the transfer through agreements on a common set of proficiencies and outcomes and have those translate to actual courses that will be accepted by the receiving institution, the more we're helping the student access with access, retention, and success. So the WICHI project has been in, in, in place since 2011. Uh, we actually had four or four Oregon institutions participating, two community colleges and two universities. And in phase two that we're about to launch, we're looking for new participants and hence the Mountain Community College and uh, the conversation that we're having with Western and Southern. So the idea behind this is really to take advantage of the work that we've done in the AAOT and to actually focus it even more in terms of that specific set of outcomes and not just courses that translate into actual courses at the receiving institution. So those two projects in particular we wanted to highlight because they really further the proficiency work that we're going through as a state at every level, the secondary, post-secondary level. And having done that work actually at the secondary level, this is something that can be enormously informative because the most challenge we face with proficiency-based work, whether it's learning, teaching, grading, is consistency and common definition. So I, I believe that any work that our post-secondary partners engage in can only further that and ultimately help and support the student and our teachers, of course. I think I'm going to stop here and I would welcome any questions or comments or feedback that you have. And David, did I answer your question? Is that good? Yeah. It's still not clear in my mind how you transfer these proficiencies, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, it's a crosswalk. It's agreements that are reached by all the participating institutions. And the value add here is that our students can, t if our students choose, not that they would, but if they choose to go out of state for higher education, community college, or university, those, the passport will be essentially treated as a passport. You know, they, you get stamped and you're accepted as a junior level status and you don't have to retake certain courses that you normally would. So are there other states doing this and are we using the information from those models? Yes, so there are convenings that WICHI holds. Uh, they've had one uh, in October. They're gonna have another one next month in Colorado where faculty actually from the institutions from these states, which I believe are Washington, Oregon, um, help me here, hold up. Is it Idaho, Alaska, Montana? Yes, but the passport project is, even though it's a witchy project, which is usually only the western states, right. there was such ex excitement about this that I think there's a potential of 10 other states joining right. on, some that are right. not even in the western region. Right. It's because students are moving all over the place, and they just see this as a nice um, tool yeah. to help them. Yeah. So we work regionally, but I think the impact is national. So when these other states come on board, our students will have the benefit of this transfer of convenience in these other areas as well. So I know you said this was in its infancy, but I'm assuming that um, as we learn what is helpful, that we might also work on statewide policy that doesn't require uh, institutions to agree to this, but instead maybe get a little boost, <laughs> push. Absolutely. Is that intended? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we're fortunate we have that we have the, the Associate of Arts Oregon Transfer Structure and the Oregon Transfer Module in the state of Oregon that facilitates a lot of transfer, transfer uh, of students between the, the segments, community colleges and universities. This could inform that further. Okay. So if there are some re refinements or some improvements that we can build on what we currently have, this allows us to learn and, and think about that. Uh, this, in my opinion, has 
great value for the proficiency work we're doing through Eastern Promise Replication Grants, the K-12 proficiency work that we're engaged in as a state more than anything else. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? All right. Elizabeth? Good morning. Good morning. For the record, Elizabeth Porter, I'm the Director of Student Success and Assessment at the Oregon Community College Association. And my colleague, Charlie Hodgson, is on the phone um, from CCWD. So, Charlie, if you have anything to add, please do just jump in. Um, this is serving as an update. I can't remember the last time I was here to talk with you all, but it's been a while. Um, so, I think it was maybe back in October, September, October. It's been a while. So I wanted to bring you up to speed with where we are with the developmental education redesign work. Um, since I last spoke with you, uh, we've gotten all 17 of the community colleges to say, yes, we want to continue on with this work. Um, we want to continue into what I'm calling phase two. Phase one was, uh, as you recall, the work of getting all the teams together. And through a nine-month process, we had them come together. Uh, they had we had presenters from across the nation come in. We read research. We um, debated different pieces. Um, and then that's when we came up with the recommendations, which are in front of you. Um, as you can see, part of uh, what the feedback that I'm getting from colleagues around the nation is, holy cow, you didn't just pick math or just pick writing. You guys picked everything. <laughs> so we're tackling a lot of different areas uh, in the community college, all the way down to um, assessment and placement and uh, professional development, um, all types of, of uh, recommendations that are out there. So uh, the first phase uh, for this work was completed in June. Uh, second phase began in November. Um, we were to have teams come in uh, in November for three different days and work with a facilitator all day long to map out plans for exactly what it was that they were going to do as a campus um, from the recommendations, how they were going to do it, who was responsible, what metrics were they going to use uh, to measure their success and, and timelines for making this happen? Well, Mother Nature had that one ice storm. Do you remember that in November? So we got delayed, had to go into December. Um, but we eventually did get every team together, and they got their, their start on their plans. Uh, just last Friday, I had the team leads come together um, in Salem. And the purpose there was to finalize those plans and to work on a project timeline. So each of the team leads uh, has now a timeline uh, that they fill out uh, every month, and it updates where they are in the process, who's responsible, what the timeline for completion is, and those all have to be signed off by their presidents. So those are due to me once a month, and then that helps me to see what it is that I can do to help support them, um, or if there's some troubleshooting that they need to have, or some more supports in other ways that I could potentially assist with. So uh, that's where we are at this point. Um, there's a myriad of things that are going on um, as far as the recommendations and who's tackling what. Um, the one that you're primarily hearing about is that math pathway, the alternate math pathway, um, the non-STEM pathway, if you will. Um, that's one that's uh, pretty much bubbled up to the state level, so basically all of the community colleges are involved in that, uh, that particular work. Um, I don't have the exact number, but it was probably five or six community colleges who were piloting uh, Math 98 either this fall or now into the winter. So it's off and running. Um, I'm going to gather those folks together uh, in the springtime who are offering Math 98, those who even aren't yet, so that they can talk about what they're teaching, what they're seeing, what the outcomes are, and their students who are transferring on from that to the 105 course, how they're doing, let's look at what's happening. Uh, because it, they want some time to see what's actually working, uh, to see how they're, they're teaching and what the impact is before we say, okay, everybody's gonna do it this way. So the first step is to let them work the kinks out We'll get them all together, see who's doing what, see what's working, and then later on, um, probably before the fall term, is when we'll get together and say, all right, what's working with this, with the Math 98? And do like we did with Math 105, as far as let's get to some common outcomes. Let's get to some commonality um, across the state so that when students take Math 98 at PCC, or they take Math 98 at Mount Hood, it's the same Math 98. And if this is, that's important because if it is going to be part of the AAOT, 
which is currently has language that says that you have to have the math course with the prerequisite of math 95 in order for it to count in the AOT. Um, we're working to get that change to say either math 95 or a quantitative literacy course um, such that this math 98 would count for that. Um, but in order to do that, we need some consistency. What so, would a quantitative literacy course look like? What would number would that be and what would be in it? It's currently math 98. Um, it's Math 93 at Rogue Community College because they uh, they wrote an NSF grant to work on this prior to the work that we got started. So they're Math 93 at the moment, but that's not something that's cast in stone. Uh, so Math 98 is the, the course number. Um, when they got together to talk about 105, uh, they were talking about a variety of different uh, outcomes, including financial literacy. Um, they were talking about uh, statistical knowledge as far as they want the courses to be something that people can actually use in life. Um, and it was interesting for me to be in that crowd because I am a math foe, I'll own that too. Um, and I was one of those people who just really hated math going into it. Um, and so they were all, this, this was a room full of math faculty for two year and four year, and they were all saying, you are the kind of person that we want to not have happen again. <laughs> we, we want to have people who take math and then can tell their, their students, their children, this is why math's important. This is what you do with math. Math isn't evil. Math is great. Look at what we can do. So they want it to be for, it's not math for consumers, but it's math for life, more or less. It's not the calculus-based, I need this to get through my chemistry necessarily, but this is how can I apply this in my real life. If I'm reading this, this newspaper and it's talking about these polls or it's talking about these statistics, can I be critical of that and actually understand what that means? So it's something that's going to be much more applicable. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, always. Go ahead. Always. <laughs> um, any conversation on, or two questions. The latest update on how Smarter Balance is used as a prereq. <clears throat> and also any discussion on having consistencies on the benchmarks or the cut scores for mm -hmm. the compass test. So there's that was two points I was going to come up with. Um, we are planning to have, part of our recommendations were to have a statewide meeting about placement and about the process for placement. That is in the works. That's um, hopefully going to happen in March. So I'm working with our instructional administrators to get a team together and then also we'll be working with these events with the Smarter Balanced Integration Team because we need to make sure that we're all on the same page with this. Um, the college is currently, uh, the cut scores are all over the, the board and I don't know that we're going to come down to one set of cut scores to be completely honest. What the colleges were talking about was having a common process with placement and then there's been discussion about a common range of cut scores. Um, so that's got to be worked out yet. Um, it hasn't been it hasn't been determined. We're taking it one step at a time. So the first meeting is actually going to be a lot of uh, finding out from the field what is it that we really need to be talking about. What are the questions? What do we need to tackle? And let's move forward from there. And I, I don't need to be. I'm not trying to be negative, Nelly, here because this is great stuff, and I know what it, what challenge you're taking on. Explain to me what the rationale is why the state of Oregon community colleges can't have a common cut score. What's the rationale for that? From what I've been told, it's uh, the faculty want to have the opportunity to have the academic rights on their campus. Okay. That's right. That, is that close, David? <laughs> well, if they think that's what, yeah, I can, I can imagine faculty saying that, if that's what they think is appropriate for entry into their programs at that college. <clears throat> So SBAC. So SBAC uh, is part of the, the placement discussion. Okay. We'll have the SBAC integration team there too because we need to talk about what would be happening with students coming out of high school, but then we also need to be addressing the other 90% who don't come directly from high school currently and what we can do for them. So another issue we've talked about here, and I can't remember if you were in the room or if the information got to you, but it's the adaptive nature of the compass mm -hmm. or any assessment that we would use. and how because it's adaptive locks kids out um, and maybe um, kind of assumes that kids can't do higher level because they miss the math on a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Is that being studied or would the multiple measures 
address that in some way? I think the multiple measures are more of what would address that. Um, in particular, the example that was in your packet for the PASS program at Clackamas uh, is a way that, that may address that. The PASS program is uh, where there's an English faculty member and a math faculty member from Clackamas Community College who actually, imagine this, are sitting down and talking with students <laughs> prior to them even taking any kind of test. Um, so they're talking with the students about, uh, you know, when was the last time you took math? Even how do you feel about math? What's your experience been with math? Talking about that kind of thing. What's going on in your life? How much are you working? Do you have your support system? You know, all of the other parts of life that impact our students that we know about um, but we can't test on. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're uh, taking the, the benefit of saying to the students, you know, if they're even close to being able to go for college level, it's like, you can do this. Let's, let's put you in college level. You're going to make it. And helping them with the supports that go around that. Now, it's only been happening for a term, um, but what uh, the math faculty member was telling me was just even to begin at this point, they're already seeing how inaccurate the compass test is. So I don't, I don't think that that's a surprise to anyone. Um, part of it is, again, of how do we scale some of these things might be working uh, maybe the together. Maybe the S back can be an answer, because here's why. You gave me an honest answer of that it's faculty control. From a K-12 guy, when we're trying to build a P-20 seamless system, when we have established state cut scores, third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, all the way through, we know that our most vulnerable kids fall through the cracks with the more prerequisites and more hoop jumping we throw. All of a sudden, if, we, if we're trying to get this transition and we have 17 different cut scores in the state of Oregon, that makes no sense. We know that. Let's just get real. That makes no sense when we have it all the way through the K-12 system. So maybe SBAC is a starting point, Elizabeth, that if we're looking at it, that's going to be heavily emphasized in K-12. We're going to have cut scores for juniors that we're held accountable for. Maybe that's a starting point that every Oregon University of Community College accepts a score at SBAC that you don't go into math 95. And that would be great for the students matriculating directly from high school. Yeah. Um, and so that is something to build on, absolutely. But we also have mm -hmm. thousands, tens of thousands of other students who don't matriculate directly from high school. So we need to figure out how to address them as well. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask that question a little bit further because I'm still kind of under, trying to understand that. I know, for example, some kids at our high school who take the AP exam, they do well. They go take the compass because they miss a couple of math. They don't get to go farther on compass, and now we're remanded to the developmental ed. Not only that, once they're remanded, don't have opportunities for other courses. Right. Is that are, are all of those issues going to be addressed along that way? They're all part of the same puzzle, absolutely. Okay. Um, and I've got colleagues at the Regional Educational Lab Northwest who are looking at the remediation aspect of students coming directly from Oregon high schools into the Oregon community colleges. So they are looking more at the research behind that. Um, there's, a, there's a myriad of issues with the placement, and we know that. So we are chipping away at it, but it's, it's not something that we want to see either. Um, we're not here to see our students uh, get stuck in the, the quagmire of developmental education, which is why we started this work to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is all part of this other parts of the puzzle that we need to address. So I think we really do need to have that information come back to us as a, as a committee that's responsible for really addressing barriers. Mm -hmm. I'm as frustrated as Mark is where adults are getting in the way of students mm -hmm. because of fear and assumptions and those kinds of things. So as we find more information, we need to kind of be pushing on that from multiple angles, not not to exclude anybody. Of course we want to keep everybody with us in the work, but it's been long enough that we're struggling with you know, adult assumptions about things that are not based in data. And so as we get the data, I would love to have that come to this committee. I have Did that duly add? noted, and I just wanted to add one other thing um, while Salam is still with us, and I think I've shared with you as well, um, that we see some other practices in other parts of the country. We just uh, visited in Texas 
a school district that is actually using the placement test. They, of course, being Texas, they use their own version of it. It happens to be similar to a 24 um, item uh, reading uh, AccuPlacer version. And they're using it as early as eighth grade just to give students a kind of a mirror on, you know, my goodness, this is kind of what you're going to be working on as you move through high school. And they help them understand that once you pass that measure of a placement test, you then could start taking college credits. Then they use it in each year of high school. They also go as so far as to say, that first of all, they're offered at the high school. That's another issue, and we only know of one place in Oregon that's doing that, and that's Tillamook, um, where the, the replacement test is offered at the high school. There may be more, but we just haven't found them yet. And we just were talking with them about what they're learning from that experiment. But by virtue of the student not having to go to a foreign place, that they're actually supported and prepped right in their high school to say, this is important. This is not something you do after a long night of whatever. Mm -hmm. And then using that to give them some feedback on here, here are your strengths, here are the areas that you're going to need to bolster as you move forward. They're having tremendous success with that to the point of having their graduation rate increase dramatically, their transfer rate, um, and the number of course credits the students earn in high school from a college just be exponentially um, increased. Including an associate degree before they finish high yep. school. Yeah. I'm greatly appreciative of the work, you know, and hearing this. I almost would like Elizabeth to be a standing agenda item because, <laughs> so that we can kind of be relentless. Because here's why: when we look at the P, our role as a P20, we look at hot spots that we're not getting it done. The developmental ed issue is one of our most significant problems Absolutely. for the equity lens. And along the way, we're having some successes in some ways where kids are falling into the cracks and disappearing. And so this one, I think, needs to be one of the top priorities for OEIB to continue to help support, massage, push, whatever it takes so that more kids hit the finish line on this. And I don't want to sound preachy, but this is a hot spot that, wow, there are a lot of kids in there. I agree. It's an equity issue. It has to be addressed uh, as quickly as possible. So knowing what, where the progress is and where the stuck points are would be really helpful to us along the way. Uh, one other piece I was going to say about that, and it went out of my head. So, well, the, one, the one aspect that uh, I could say about the placement in the high schools and things, obviously there's always a resource issue with that, right? And I've been hearing about some other pieces of uh, advising that some colleges have used that they were like $5 per student. And it's, it gets down to a lot of resource. Uh, mm -hmm. So as the OEIB, if you could help us with getting some resource to actually make this implementation, because trust me, if we had students who were better prepared coming into our college, we would be very happy. We would be happy to not have this developmental education discussion. And I understand the resource need, and we've run into that in the schools as well. So, right, we have multiple measures. We've been doing it for a long time. Perhaps we could learn from what K-12 has already experienced, and there are ways that we can find around that. Mm -hmm. And I think SBAC is another great example. It's already happening. Mm -hmm. So if there was a way to come to common cut scores, then you take out the need for resource on that one right mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Same thing with Compass and some of the other places where we find solutions. So um, I hear that about resource, but I also am going to kind of throw, throw it back, like playing tennis here, um, about finding the ways where it's going to be more cost effective and reach the most kids. And I would encourage uh, in any way that you can, and first of all, I want to commend that you have all 17 community colleges because I really understand the challenge with that. So that's great. But um, it would be great if we could get the group to also own the need to really address the equity issues there. Because I, I think if you look through an equity lens, you get away from the argument that centers around adults and you get more focused on really how are we going to reach right. those Right, we kids. particularly see that with low socioeconomic individuals mm -hmm. as well. And I, I think it's safe to say that you would have the support from pretty much every superintendent in the state to address this as the most important issue that we see as a barrier. And we see many ways we could help with that at the K-12 level. So 
I don't know to what extent you're involving the K-12 group in this conversation about how we would work together. And um, currently the team leads are just meeting amongst themselves. Okay. So we haven't extended it out beyond that campus at, at the moment. But again, okay. working with the placement and the SBAC. Um, the other piece that we're working on is the need for more advising training. Um, there's campuses who are having their faculty do advising, and that's wonderful. Um, but we all know professional development money is tight everywhere, and so one of the things that I'm working with our student services administrators on is bringing uh, a national trainer from the National Association, Academic Advising Association, NACADA, bringing in someone and doing training, and I don't know if that's going to be in three places around the state or exactly the logistics of it, but bringing in someone who can actually work with faculty and professional advising staff about what are the best practices and what is the new way to be working with students to help them become more successful. And you know, that isn't just a, a question at that right. transition point as well. We right. had some reports last time that were about that kind of guidance counseling yep. and the desperate we need, need we have in K-12 to do that too. And that's so that's another area exactly. where we could work together exactly. on that. Exactly, and that's again where opening it up and bringing in people mm -hmm. so that the school districts in the area they want to send the guidance counselors or whomever mm -hmm. would be fabulous. That would be great. Yeah. We can help Absolutely. get that out. So please let us know as you go along the work how we can help. Um, I do believe that we'll probably dr be drafting some kind of recommendation that involvement with K-12 folks, mm -hmm. whether it's with the guidance counseling or working on the multiple measures mm -hmm. and assessment or folks. Yeah, assessment folks would be great. So we'll work on that and get back to you. Welcome, Kay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. It's great to have you here. Um, you. Anything else, Salam, that you wanted to add to her conversation? I know you're getting ready to leave, so... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the work that Elizabeth is doing, and I just think it's important to think as a continuum, if you yep. will. I appreciate what Mark said about 220, and we have to consider the implications of anything that any one of our segments does on the other. So I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share some information with you today. Thank you. Great. Good work. I just wanted to call it one more thing before the two of you leave. Not that we're asking you to respond now, but there were a few other things we identified uh, before that we're going to ask you to follow up with us. And Hilda can send them to you, but I'll mention them now. Um, to identify solutions to barriers faced by students accessing the Oregon Opportunity Grants. Um, who have, who lacks citizenship and who have earned a modified diploma. So that was one recommendation that had come previously. Another one is to address the barriers of districts falling short of eligibility for TRIO program. I'm one of those districts who actually succeeded and then lost the opportunity because we were successful. So we just think that, again, that's another kind of gap that needs to be addressed there. And the third one is examining the summer melt. Okay. So Thank Salam you. and I will meet since okay. uh, he just kind of came on board with HEC. Yeah. These were um, items that came up during last year's meetings, and so we're kind of carrying them over to make sure that if uh, if there's a group that's working on these issues that at HEC that we know about that. Okay, excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, both of you. Yeah. All right. Back to the beginning. And Oh, thank you for the reminder. Now that we do have a quorum, we'll go back. I'm looking for an approval of the agenda, <laughs> even though we move forward on it. We have, let's make this official. So I, moved. Second. And we have a motion and a second. Anyone opposed? Okay. We'll take that as approval. The second one is approval of the December 9th meeting notes. I did send some edits to Hilda, so it would be including just those edits. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Anybody opposed? All right. That's approval of the meeting notes from December 9th. So we'll go on in the agenda to 6.0, which is introduction and context for discussion on personalized learning by Hilda. So uh, first of all, these subcommittee meetings have really enabled deeper look and dive into some big issues that um, 
cross over K-12 and post-secondary. And uh, we really uh, witnessed that last month when we dug into thinking around advising and personalized learning requirements, and we've taken actions on some of those pieces. This particular um, topic is centered around several areas of work that are all connected but not yet unified and driving the state. And I would summarize something as simple as the fact that if we truly are going to make it to 40-40-20 without thinking about changing the way students are engaged in curriculum, then we're probably going to be wasting a lot of effort. And we have this conversation in the OEIB staff regularly. I hear it when I'm with my ODE colleagues. I hear it when I'm working with communities of color who say, you know, we have to think about more culturally responsive teaching that engages students. I hear it when I talk to my CTE colleagues around applied learning. I go back and I look at an Oregon Business Roundtable report from 2008. I hear it when I look at Linda Darling Hammond's recommendation to the governor. I look back and I think about um, a video that Duncan Weiss put together from the Oregon Business Council that you're going to see. It's very short. Um, in one moment as he tees it up. I hear about this when I am part of an innovation lab network team with some of my colleagues who are here in the room uh, and we're going to hear from one of their uh, officers in a moment. I hear it when I used to be in attendance at the Business Education Compact Board um, and what I don't hear is how we're going to bring all this together and get past what sometimes is ownership issues, language and vocabulary, political issues, strategies and policies that are getting in the way. Um, and I just think some of us don't want to retire from this profession before having really left a mark in moving this agenda forward. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Hadn't thought about that option, but let's cue on that note. Let's watch Sorry. the movie. Sometimes just it keep feels going, like... Just keep going. So, um, so this... we've got this tried and true school system where children like Ellie move through elementary, middle, and high school, and then they go on to college. Seems pretty normal, right? Well, the thing is, that system isn't working for enough of our kids and for us as a state. A third of our kids drop out of high school, and we're lucky if half of those who go on make it through college. Those numbers are even higher for poor and minority children. Why does this happen? All of our students are capable of success. We have dedicated and talented educators. The main problem is the way our system is designed. It's a factory model that moves kids along in batches, where too many fall behind and drop out, or move on even when they haven't mastered the material. That may have worked 50 years ago, when low-skilled jobs paid a good wage. That isn't the case anymore. There has to be a better way. Let's ask Ellie. Wow, we're all different. We have different dreams. We learn differently too. Maybe school should be like a GPS. We know where we want to go. With some help and navigation and someone to believe in us, we can chart our own path. Let us learn at our own pace and show you at every step that we're ready for the next. We can learn in a lot of ways too. Online, in the community, in projects, in problem solving, and working with our classmates. This way the learning is really ours, and our best teachers inspire us, guide us, and work beside us. We like this way better, and so do our teachers. It lets us go as fast and as far as we want. Thanks, Ellie. It's up to all of us to give Ellie this kind of learning experience. First, we have to believe she and all of her classmates can succeed. Next, our teachers need more time, support, and freedom to collaborate so they can nurture such learning and grow as well. Then we have to rethink and redesign our entire education system to make it happen. That's what the governor, our legislature, and our educators have set in motion. We call it student-centered teaching and learning. All of us can play a part. Let's give Ellie, her classmates, and all of Oregon a much brighter future. To see how and how you can help, go to OregonLearns.org. So as you can see there, um, he introduced in this video the term student-centered learning. 
you all got some pre-reading as members of this committee that really gave you a lot of the terminology that's being used around the nation. Uh, things like anytime, anywhere learning, blended learning, deeper learning, competency-based education, proficiency-based models, next generation learning, and student-centered learning. And what I really liked about one of the documents um, that was developed by Jobs for the Future is that it sort of said you need some of the components of all of these things working together in unison to really help students um, eventually own curriculum as is suggested here in the video. Um, you also were given a short blog to read about um, students and, and how they were using some of their elements of support from teachers in different ways, like things like office hours with teachers, um, and also the idea that teachers help them reflect on their independent growth, and then also a parking lot. Um, t good teachers are trained to not let kids always ask them every question, but to first ask somebody else to see if they can problem solve before they ask the teacher. And then there's parking lots where generally teachers know, oh, there's a number of you that need clarification on a concept. We need to go back and figure a different way to present that and engage you. So with that, I am very pleased to introduce one of my colleagues who is actually on the phone. Um, she is based in um, California. And Jennifer Poon is the Innovation Lab Network Director, which is an outgrowth of the Council for Chief State School Officers um, that has really taken on this work of helping states um, sort through policies and kind of get their items all aligned if they really are committed to a more student-centered um, model. So at this point in time, Jennifer, are you with us? Before Jennifer, you speak, I just want to mention all of the items oh, we yeah. have under this one. Uh, actually, we wouldn't have enough time for everything on the agenda if everybody took probably the full amount of time you gave them. So I am going to ask people to shorten it as much as possible, and I'm also going to ask the committee to ask your questions and discuss as we go along. Each one has to be within that time period, or we're not going to get discussion in it at all. So Jennifer, please move forward. Thank you. Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me, and do you have a copy of my slides with you as well? Yes. All yes. you have to do is say advance, and Seth will advance. Okay, great. Well, sure. So um, we'll go ahead and advance to the slide with the main points, and um, I'll, I, I could be as brief as just leaving you with this slide. Um, I, I think what we had wanted to convey as part of this presentation, um, I think Hilda said it best, actually, to make it towards the college and career ready goals for students or your 40-40-20 goal, uh, we believe we must fundamentally change the way that students interact with learning and personalize learning, uh, which, as I'll go forward in one of these slides to describe as inclusive of all of the different components that Hilda laid out, blending anytime, anywhere, competency-based, et cetera, um, we're calling it personalized learning, and it really is the how to achieving the what of that college and career readiness. Second main point of this um, presentation is that the transition to personalized learning is complex and requires coordinated system-wide shifts in policy and practice at state and local levels. Um, we, we just can't expect teachers to independently make the transition to personalized learning one by one. Um, there really need to be systemic supports and shifts in policy. And that, um, you know, some uh, silver lining here is through the work of many states, including Oregon, examples of opportunities for state action are emerging. Um, so on the next slide, I just wanted to contextualize this presentation in the conversations that we've had with Oregon and other states as part of the Innovation Lab Network. Um, the network is facilitated by CCSSO, and it states taking action to really identify, test, and implement systems of student-centered learning um, and doing that in ways that engage leaders at the local level, engage state policymakers uh, as kind of a united conversation and uh, system-wide uh, or systemic transformation. Um, so on the next slide, and uh, you might need to click through it to populate all of the text there, click through it twice maybe, um, this is kind of the way that the Innovation Lab Network has come to really understand personalized learning as, again, that, that how of getting towards um, every student, or in this case, every Oregonian, a graduate, ready for success. 
And we believe there are six key components um, that need to be considered. One, that the system has to rely on clear, high expectations that include students' knowledge, skills, and dispositions, or which you all call essential skills, um, that, that students must be able to progress based upon demonstrations of their learning, that it's no longer just about sitting in the seats, um, but that there have to be authentic demonstrations of learning and students uh, moving through courses or even uh, earning credentials based on those demonstrations, so competency-based learning. And the customizable pathways piece being that students uh, should, should not be expected to have a one-size-fits-all education or a factory batch model, but that there ought to be multiple customizable ways for students to navigate the material, to leverage their skills and interests. Uh, in order to succeed. And that these three components are then supported by the three components at the bottom, which are comprehensive systems the student support, anytime, anywhere learning, uh, which includes both digital and blended learning, as well as incorporating um, out of school or, or out of school time experiences. And then uh, really anchoring everything in a deliberate focus on student agency, meaning that students have um, you know, voice and choice in uh, guiding their, uh, their learning and ownership of that as well. And I think the point of this slide, especially um, as you see all of the different uh, specific examples from, from Oregon, uh, is that you all have many of these pieces in place. Uh, a lot of the components are there. Um, the key really lies in how they all line up together to drive towards college and career readiness and success and how the rest of the system aligns to support it. Um, so the next slide was just a little snapshot from the video that you just watched. And, and the point is it really does take a coordinated system. Um, I was asked to talk specifically about policy levers. Um, and there are a number that I'll point to specifically related to personalized learning or, or most directly related. But I think it, there really is a whole system framework that needs to be considered around funding, around assessment, around data systems, et cetera, um, so that these pieces are driving together towards the ultimate goal. Uh, so on the next slide, um, the Innovation Lab Network has a particular way of, I guess, parsing through or, or bucketing the different policy and implementation levers that states hold. Uh, this is called our Policy and Implementation Logic Model. Um, there are five different buckets there, uh, along with enabling conditions and implementation levers. I think in the interest of time, I won't read it all to you, um, but it is a comprehensive framework that not only includes, again, those, those policy levers most directly related to personalized learning, which I will get into on the next slide, but also everything from how states are defining and systemizing college and career readiness um, in a way that include, is inclusive of these kind of deeper learning knowledge and skills that personalized learning brings out, uh, how they're aligning systems of assessment and accountability and developing seamless pathways uh, to college and career. So I guess on the next slide is where I'll just spend a couple of minutes and then um, hand it back to the other presenters who can dive in a little bit more and, and touch on, I think, a variety of areas within that logic model. Um, but this is kind of some, uh, a variety of different policy objectives um, that could be advanced to enable personalized learning. And we also include within this section of our logic model preparing the educator workforce um, so that all students can succeed. So we're already beginning to understand several ways that states might approach this work. Um, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. And I think we could even go through and inventory several ways that Oregon is already leading in this work, some ways it might want to lead in the future, and also some you know, possible objectives or state actions that are not relevant or, or not particular targets at this time. But I wanted to, um, because I was asked to share with you all specific policies as well as state examples of how states are moving forward, um, let me just kind of go through a few of these and provide some state examples. So policy objective A in the first row um, is that the state could set conditions where students co-design learning, set goals, and map their own progress. Um, potential state actions include uh, requiring the creation and use of individualized learning plans for all students. This is something that we see, uh, for example, in Kentucky, who requires every student to have an individualized learning plan at the sixth grade, which they've then linked to their state information systems and accountability systems and advisory program. We also see examples of this in Maine, requiring ILPs at grade seven. 
Uh, and also uh, another potential state action is to implement or support districts to select and implement online systems and analytical tools to help students plan and monitor their learning towards defined goals. Wisconsin is an example of uh, a state that's implementing a statewide learning management system that will allow students and educators to connect, access, and share high quality content. Uh, in uh, policy objective B, states could set conditions where students progress to earn credentials based on demonstrating competency, demonstrating mastery of predefined competencies. So um, example state actions are enacting policy to replace seat time requirements with the demonstration of competencies and also I think alongside that actually defining what those competencies are or at least a uh, model set of competencies to which districts can align their own. Um, I think we see a number of examples of states, I believe including Oregon, where uh, seat time is optional and districts have the option of um, uh, demonstrating through competencies. Um, I think in New Hampshire in particular, it's not actually optional, it's a requirement. Um, public high schools must base credit on mastery rather than seat time. Uh, the second potential state action within that category is to enact policy to set guidelines for competency-based diplomas. And here Maine is an example. Um, all districts are required to offer a proficiency-based diploma incorporating all content and standards by 2017. Um, so in the third category, letter C, uh, the state could set conditions where students have multiple anytime, anywhere pathways to, deter uh, to demonstrate mastery, and that might include developing a program through which students can participate in and earn credit for extended learning opportunities. Uh, we see that in uh, New Hampshire, we see that in Maine, Iowa, Kentucky, there are a number of states that are pursuing this. Um, states could also uh, create multiple pathways for students to progress uh, toward their college and career goals like through CTE, dual credit, credit flex. Uh, Ohio is a great example of credit flex policy um, that requires districts and schools to provide multiple pathways for earning high school credit. Uh, and creating instructional materials policy to incentivize transition to high quality digital resources or OER. Uh, in the fourth category, states could set conditions where students demonstrate progress through complex challenges. Um, so this is really getting at uh, more ways of assessing student competency, um, and that might involve replacing or augmenting graduation requirements with complex demonstrations such as capstone projects, portfolios, etc., or replacing or augmenting exit exams, again with some sort of high quality capstone or performance based assessment. Um, Colorado here is an example of a state pioneering creating a menu of options for satisfying their new state graduation guidelines. And in the last section, um, it, it kind of doesn't it follow quite the same tone as the rest of them, but it's incredibly important. And that's if we're going to uh, support the shift towards personalized learning, the educator workforce must be prepared with the, the right skills, the right abilities to thrive in those um, personalized competency-based learning environments. And so here, it really any portion of the educator workforce development pipeline uh, is ripe for innovation, whether that's certification requirements or perhaps a credential endorsement, whether that's really revising educator preparation program requirements or accreditation processes, whether that's uh, aligning professional development initiatives um, to support the delivery of personalized learning. Um, a number of states are, are pushing forward different avenues and the Innovation Lab Network has actually just launched an effort to define what are educator competencies for personalized learning and work with a small number of interested states and their relevant stakeholders or, or um, relevant decision makers uh, on, on these issues to actually embed those competencies and make them meaningful in state systems. Um, the, the last slide before my contact information just takes you back to the logic model and that's because I think it's really important to say that, again, there's a, a whole number of directions that the state can move in order to support personalized learning, um, but it all must fit within a coherent system. I think my colleague Corey Curl um, will be talking to you all in just a little bit about um, a visioning exercise, you know, really starting this work with figuring out the why are we doing this, the how, the at what scale are we supporting, are we requiring, are we, you know, somewhere in between. 
and then really thinking about all the different levers of the system, including assessment and accountability. Uh, CCSSO and the Innovation Lab Network has done a, a lot of work on that that I'd be happy to share. Um, but I really just kind of wanted to leave us with the, the notion that this is a systemic shift. It is complex. We do have state models um, of pieces moving forward, but it really is important that the key stakeholders, you know, in a particular state, given that particular state's context and its goals, really map this out and figure out how all these pieces align together. And that's some of the support that we at CCSSO and the Innovation Lab Network uh, stand ready and available to provide to the extent that it's useful to you. So I think I'll, I'll um, hand it back in the interest of time, and um, thanks, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. I, this is really helpful. I really love the logic model, and I think that um, I'm also glad to know that we are participating in a process to help us identify, because I think we're working on all of those. Uh, but I know even for us, it's been hard to visualize how they all work together and how they're aligned so we can actually know if we're getting somewhere. Um, and it is a systemic shift, so, you know, everything's shifting. So it's helpful to know that. I appreciate um, this and your work and Hilda's and others' participation in it. Is there anything you want to add, Hilda, or should we just go to the next, or do we have questions? Well, I think this time? sets the stage for okay. um, some of the more local presentations, so I think it's probably, given our time frame, um, that we should go ahead and move okay. forward. So let's move forward with uh, Tam. Should we have everybody come forward since it's all? Yeah. Anybody yeah. who's presenting, do you want to come forward? If you have a classroom voice that carries. I have a classroom voice. <laughs> we'll let you sit here. Sit in front of the mic and use that classroom <laughs> voice. And if you feel like you need to face the audience to be heard, you're welcome to join us on this side of the table. Jim Carlisle, you're in this group as well. Corey Curl, Sarah. Just Corey's Everybody on the come phone. Corey's forward. On the phone. Corey's on the phone. Okay. We'll begin with Tamara and then move to Mike Fisher, um, Signal Me Community Committee members, if you have something you want to say or ask. Okay, Tamara. great. Thank you very much. And let you. me know if the audience can't hear me, but I think I you know, can project pretty loudly. I'm Tamara Bush Johnson, Executive Director of the Business Education Compact. You've seen me here before. I have a model, personal model. I never give up. So I'm you know, here again. <laughs> we'll try again. Good. Welcome. Honorable Chair and Committee members, uh, thank you for allowing time on your agenda. At a previous uh, meeting, uh, Chair Curtis asked what investments would really help impact key outcomes of all of our achievement compacts and underserved populations. And, and I think we're here all to testify today to uh, an answer that it is personalized, student-centered learning through proficiency practices. Um, and, it, and I'll be using proficiency interchangeable, personalized learning, you know, wh whatever resounds with you. It's competency-based education. It's, you know, it's all similar. It has to work together. Um, it's, we feel, uh, and from an earlier report that Hilda cited, that it is the, the one potential for the highest return on investments in the shortest time frame. Um, so my remarks briefly, and I know that I have on a time base, so I'm going to be, you know, hurrying right through as much as possible, but it's, uh, the, you know, the need, what is our proficiency and what does the BEC use as a definition for proficiency in the state? How do we know these strategies really meet the students' needs and some of the successes that we've had and uh, looking at kind of the future of proficiency and recommendations for actions? So in terms of the need, Ellie said it very well, you know, that we have this kind of current factory model. Of, of education, that it's not working, and that it actually leaves a lot of holes um, in it, as uh, Sal Khan from Khan Academy calls it Swiss cheese education. It's, it has holes. Students are moved through the next grade level with their cohorts, um, age-based, after spending the standard amount. We all are equal in the amount of time we sit in the seat. And then they earn credits and advance in high school. Students need only a cumulative grade average of an F. Uh, in order to get a high school diploma. So what does that diploma really stand for? So remediation rates at the community college level also reflect this system deficit. And I just learned at the Oregon Business Summit, I don't know if the rest of you were there, that 68% of our enrolling students in a community college required uh, basic proficiencies or they lack proficiencies and have to take remediation, paying for college classes that really don't apply to their degree. So over the many years, our, you know, our high school rates, as you know, have been stagnant. So what, what is proficiency-based teaching and learning, personalized learning? So early on in the work, Oregon Department of Education 
uh, it was after the 2002 and said you can have credit by proficiency that that uh, BEC began uh, training in credit by proficiency and the state says well wait a minute you know we could have as many definitions of proficiency as we have teachers in the state let's get a definition so they asked the BEC to write a definition well instead of just a one-page paper Diane is an overachiever and she wrote it's about time uh, which is a handbook and a framework and she's here today and I have copies for each of you if you want one um, but you're, you're welcome to have one so that is the, the definition that we use it actually has rubrics for teachers so teachers know whether or not they are actually you know conducting strategies in proficiency based teaching and learning it's a very very helpful workbook so the five elements that we use uh, that are re really consistent across the nation and all over the states the BEC uh, sits on advisory committees or Diane does on advisory committees at the national level so we're right in, right in tune with what the where the nation is going you have this article in front of you uh, with those uh, definitions but the kind of the five basic elements of personalized uh, 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 personalized learning or proficiency is that students work at their own uh, pace and at their and then they advance to that next level so they're no longer passed along just because they've sat in the seat long enough or that there are a certain age when they come into school and that's that's where they are. So it's it's truly that these advancements are made solely on academic achievement, not behavior. It's the only way that we can really predict success in, in college and career. The second one is the standards include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that engagement and motivation actually increases when students know what is expected of them. Uh, in our training, we ask all the teachers to post their learning targets so that the students can see what they are uh, and, to, and to let students know, well, what does it look like for me to be proficient in that standard? What does it look like if I'm, I want to master that? Or what does it look like if I'm not quite there? So it's, you know, to be explicit and uh, no hidden agendas. The third one is that assessments are meaningful and a positive learning experiences for students. You all know what it feels like to get an F. You know, I chase points just probably like our kids did and, and, and that you probably have. And it's, it wasn't about the learning. It was always about what that grade was and what it was. Proficiency really changes the questions and the discussions in the classroom with kids. It, they are no longer just chasing those points. They're actually talking about their learning. And that is the transformation that we need to see and that we are fortunate enough to see when we work with uh, teachers in this way. The fourth one is that students receive timely and differentiated support based on their individual needs. We're really good at equal, being equal in, in our schools, and that's how it's always been. Everyone receives the same kind of treatment. Equity needs to be back and introduced into our classrooms by having students need help who needs help and advance those students who don't need the help. We're holding them back in many, in many ways and not giving them uh, the opportunity to reach their potential. So the fifth one is also that learning outcomes emphasize knowledge and application. And with proficiency, we are always moving those students on to higher levels of thinking skills on that Bloom's taxonomy. Thus, it prepares, really prepares them for those uh, tests and the Smarter Balance test as well. Uh, we find that the areas that are most challenging when we work with, with uh, uh, teachers across the state is to assess students when they're ready, that students advance upon mastery, and that learning is personalized. That is the toughest. Even our own proficiency coaches who are experts in it with proficiency have a tough time with personalized learning. It's really hard. We have 145 students. So how am I going to do that? You know, how to do that? So how does it really meet the need? And what successes have we had today? So every student is engaged in their learning. Failure really is not an option. Uh, that is, is not even... Uh, uh, Come to, come to fruition in any of the proficiency classes because every student has an opportunity to be successful. They don't have to repeat a semester course, sit in the whole class again when they probably only missed some portion of it. Um, so we really need to think of um, doing things better. Teachers, and another one is teachers experience a new sense of fulfillment because they say, wow, every student, there is hope for every child to be successful now. So they see, they feel really good about what they're doing. Um, I just had a teacher recently said she just cried when she had to advance this third grader onto fourth grade, even though that third grader was not competent in reading. 
and yet they had to move on. It was a social promotion that was expected at that school. We still do that in many, many of our schools today, too many. So by pushing uh, K-12 toward this radical change, we also push higher education. There are models across the nation on the East Coast where students actually, where there are some grants given out by the federal government that allow students to really meet the goals, the competencies, the standards of a community college, and one student recently finished in three months versus two years. Think of how many opportunities and that students pay per month, not by, by the credit. They pay per month. So if a motiv highly motivated student wants to finish college early, they could. Um, so we, uh, we know proficiency works. We have data, and I have, I have extras of these. If you're interested in reading, I have brief success stories. But BEC does a global survey every year to all of the teachers we have trained in the state. Um, I have a map for you if you're interested. This shows the map of where we have been. We have been in um, 34 of 36 counties. And we have 72% of the school districts served. 142 of 197 school districts have participated in some way with some of our proficiency training. And then on the back side, it actually has a graph of when we started back in 2005 with the actual training. And you can notice that we really peaked up in these years. More than 1,000 teachers have been trained. That was when we had House Bill 2220 in effect. And schools are saying, wow, we have really got to change our grading practices. Well, unfortunately, some schools just changed their grading practices, but not their instruction. And so that was the result of 4150 that came about because some teachers in some districts, not to the fault of the teachers of the districts, but they implemented poorly, and it backlashed on us. And so we were fortunate enough, enough for this year to go deeper, but it did show a drop because some teachers then, the administrators frankly felt they were punched in the stomach uh, because that really kind of stopped a little bit of their momentum in moving forward, but we're back on this track again, and uh, we are going deeper into the demonstration sites with the um, Oregon Department of Education um, um, ODE grant that we, that we have. And that ODE grant uh, was this past year. We received it in April of that year. And we, the grant purpose was to establish four proficiency personalized learning demonstration sites in the state. And through an application process, you know, we uh, selected four schools, Madras High School in Jefferson County, and we have Nate speaking here in a few minutes, uh, Sunset School on Coos Bay, Talmadge Middle School in Central School District, and Madison Middle School in the Eugene School District. And these activities include, you know, proficiency coaches, really coaching side by side with the teachers in their schools and providing them resources and the professional development that the teachers need to be successful in this. A short time frame, we, are, we have an outside evaluator, um, EPIC, that is working with us in this work. Um, but of course, it's, it's too soon. It's only been half a year now with this. But um, so we are, we'll have a final report and I hope that you will, will look at that as that is published. Can I just ask a question yes. about that report? I think what would be helpful specifically to our work is identify, identification of specific barriers that continue to persist. Mm -hmm. um, I Being a district that's doing yes. proficiency K all the way through and completely aligned, there are still barriers, there are still issues we're addressing, and it would be great to know what you're continuing to see in those test sites. Um, and any policy recommendations for what we might uh, discuss um, that helps eliminate those uh, barriers. Absolutely. We did do that in our interim report, not the policy piece, but we did address the barriers okay. uh, pieces of it. But um, so, yeah, I think we're, can, we're wrap, wrap wrapping up. up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it just wanted to, if we look at some of the um, recommendations then or some, some, some thoughts for some consideration is that, you know, how can the state capitalize on this, this initial small investment um, in proficiency and personalized learning? Um, how can we move from these demonstration sites to perhaps scale it? You know, and I know that I, um, OLN and ILN and uh, Achieve, you know, can help with that with some of the perhaps policy work. And how do we um, continue that critical critical investment? How do we keep looking at some of that data and actually have a, have a 
a state data of, of uh, what are those barriers and what, what does it mean for policy implementation at the state level? What I think would be helpful for us, uh, because there's so much in this, um, and I think what's helping us is where we can see the coordination and alignment with some of the other work going mm -hmm. on. So as you work on recommendations, um, thinking about how specifically OEIB, based on the nature of our work and the other work that's already going on, how VEC might link up with some of that mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So it's not just sitting out here as proficiency. And one way that occurred to me, given our previous presentation, is uh, the conversation of proficiency at in the community college conversation. I don't know if any link has happened or begun there. Were you going to add something to that? No, OK. So um, I think that that would be very helpful to me. I don't know what, if you have other recommendations, because what we're trying to do here is not just have groups present, here's what we're doing, mm -hmm. because we can say, nice, nice work. This is great, but we need your help in linking that and making sure that what we're learning about the barriers, how we're overcoming them, and what policy work still needs to be done. If you can be uh, explicit about that, it helps us because okay. we're looking at so many things. So that education network on. too that we have that I know um, Hilda is, the Oregon is involved Educator in Educator Network Portal. That we're that you'll be hearing way. from so <laughs> shortly. We're very connected with that. All the you know the the uh, curriculum material, the assessments, you know the, the work that we find and that we gather from mm -hmm. teachers all across the state. We're working very closely with Sarah, you know, and, and Hilda on that network so that we can share that with the whole state. Great, and I think that's helpful. Again, I think where you can define those crossover points and, and where we as this panel can really help move it Great. forward. Great, we helpful. would welcome that invitation. Thank you. All right. Okay. We're going to move right on. We're looking at our time. We basically have approximately 35 minutes for the remaining presentation. So, so my agenda says Mike Fisher, but I yep. Are you Mike's Mike? Right, Mike, Mike's right there. Here. Okay. Is that who we're moving to next? Uh, there's a clip from um, Madras, Madras okay. and the superintendent is here. Assistant uh, principal. <laughs> Excuse me. You want to do the clip first? Or? Clip. This should be a two-minute clip. Two minutes felt good for us. So so that traditional system worked well for us. At Madras High School, the staff doesn't reflect the student body. We are a, we are a bunch of middle class white people teach, teaching learners who are not necessarily middle class white people. And um, that's kind of a foundation with the cultural work that we do that we say, you know, how do we remove our cultural, so I bring an institutional history of education working for me to the table. So I have all of those components that work so well for me that I want to say this is how we learn. But today, with technology and the new way, what we know about learners, we need to break those down and we need to work hard at doing that. And so if we try to force it onto teachers, it's not going to work. And it is hard and difficult conversations to have for certain. Um, but I think it's being willing, even though um, I just learned a new term, which was a patient tension that we need to be able to live in a, in a patient tension. We know the work is so important, we have to go to this. We have to go to it now, and we get so like, oh, I want it all, I want it all right now. But if we're not ready, you need to take the time to make sure those who are the key implementers, and in this case, it's the learning facilitators, right? It's the teachers, it's the front line. They have to believe in it, and if they don't, and we, we had that because we did have a little bit of top down in our rollout system, and that will not help you move forward. So is this the right work for an educational environment where there is a, a, a cultural difference between the teaching staff and the student body, or where there's a cultural diversity gap that we need to fill? We have found that, so I, I can't answer for all places, but we have found that it has um, you know, we use the term level the playing field or different things like that. So say that practice work and performance assessments are happening within the classroom so that whether I have a table at home that I'm able to do my homework on or not, kind of removes that barrier and we bring in time within the school day to have those interventions and that time with teachers. Time with teachers for assistance has been, um, for us, a clear piece. So we have several pieces, but that's a clear piece that has helped us realize different needs of different learners 
And then, I mean, the clear targets of proficiency-based teaching and learning remove so many barriers because you're able to see, this is what I need to do, this is what I need to know now. What we're working on right now is really helping our learners to understand how to navigate that system. If this is what I need to do, this is what I need to know, what do I need to ask? to get there, what assistance do I need as myself, you, my, me as a learner, and, and that's our growth point right now, because we've, we've just kind of laid the system out, and now we need to help the learners navigate it so they can take us to the next level. Okay. All right. Is there anything you want to add to that? Will you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Nate Tyler, assistant principal at Madras High School. Um, I have the pleasure of not only uh, being an administrator in this system, but I also helped develop it as a teacher. I was part of the original group of four teachers that went to a BEC conference in Salem uh, several years ago, and so I helped uh, make the system, taught under the system, and now I'm an administrator under it. Um, for those that don't know Madras, 34% uh, Caucasian, 38% Hispanic, 27% Native American, 41% um, of our students qualify for ELL at some point uh, throughout their educational career. 77% um, free and reduced lunch. We have a lot of barriers uh, reaching our students, as you heard Principal uh, Brandon Smith, and that's what this work was about. It was about equity. Uh, our students, um, they don't have homes where they can go to mom and dad and ask for help on, on homework and assignments. Uh, so to give points for homework uh, automatically put them at a big disadvantage. And so that's what this work was about, was getting away from points and can you learn the material. And so that's, that's where we really focused on. And Madras has taken it um, kind of to the extreme. Uh, students have to pass 100% of all the standards in a class in order to pass the class. So if there's 25 math standards, they have to pass all 25. They, 24 is not good enough. They have to pass all 25. To further that, we say that students have to retain their knowledge. So they have to pass it a certain number of times. So more, most of our courses, they have to pass it three times. The first time is like an, a formative assessment or a take-home exam as a gateway to show the teacher that they are ready for the exam. And then the second um, one is more of a traditional unit exam. And the third either takes place in the midpoint of the next unit or a midterm or a final down the road to show that they have retained the knowledge. So it's not about learning and forgetting. It's about actual knowledge that the students learn and retain throughout the semester. Um, in order to support our students, uh, we had to completely change our schedule. We have a buff power hour, an hour-long lunch, where students can work with teachers. At the end of the day, on every Friday, we give students another hour to work with our teachers. So that's six hours built into the school day now where they can work with uh, teachers instead of having to stay after school because we know, our, especially our Native population, they cannot do that. Um, it really improved teaching practices as far as transparency. Um, you heard Ms. Brandon Smith talk about that. Um, instead of just spitting out knowledge and students trying to figure out what's important, what's not, and then you know that differs between teachers, um, our teachers work together to form those assessments. They're the same assessments in each course. Um, the rubrics are handed out to the students prior to the unit, and it has the standards that are being addressed. And then it has the grade breakdown for the not eligible, not yet proficient, proficient exceeds in mastery. And it tells the students exactly what they need to know, what they need to be able to do. And so it's very transparent, and the student knows exactly, hey, I'm going to get a C, or I'm going to be proficient on this standard because I'm not quite at that level. And so the students are really able to take uh, their education and, and hold on to it and be responsible for it. Um, I, I guess, at last, I'd, I'd just like to mention, we, this work uh, could not happen without the SIG grant. We were awarded uh, $3.1 million. Um, which really helped us with the professional development. Um, all of our veteran teachers that have been around for longer than two years have attended BEC conferences. Um, we allowed our department's work days um, where they could just work for an entire day as a department developing curriculum. We also paid teachers during the summer, uh, summer curriculum contracts to develop their curriculum for proficiency-based uh, teaching and learning. Um, our school district this year, our, our school board this year, uh, did vote that we are going to go K-12. Um, if not the fall of 2015, then definitely the fall of 2016. Um, and uh, um, coincidentally enough, we do have two teachers exploring uh, personalized mastery systems right now where students are able to move at their own pace, whether the teacher is ready for them to move on or not. And so we are 
continuing to move forward and not being stagnant or standing still in this in this process. Great. Thank you. Who provided the grant? The state of Oregon. That wasn't the proficiency no. ODE grant. School improvement. That, that was school. the uh, yeah, school tier improvement. two school improvement grant. I have one question. You were saying students are required to pass all 25? Correct. How, what percentage do? Um, so we, we don't do numbers. We don't do a percentage. So like for our math exam, um, there will be five, te five questions. And these are the most basic questions for that standard. A student has to be 100% on I think she means what percentage of students, students actually are able to pass. Actually. Um, so better than, better than in the traditional system. So in my own experience, um, traditionally in the, in the traditional system, I was about 35, 38% of students would fail my science class. Once I moved to the uh, proficiency-based system, it dropped into the 20s. Um, 23, I think, was the last year I, I was in the classroom. And so um, it sounds like you are really ramping up the rigor, and you are. But the students, because of the clear targets, they're not guessing at what they need to know. They can look and say, I need to know this, and they, they get there. Okay, and for those students that don't? I know I'm taking up more time than we That's have okay. right now. Good but question. I'm just curious about those students that are question. not able to. So we have two groups of happens. students that don't get there. We have our NYP students are not yet proficient, and our NE students are not eligible. Our NE students are the students that didn't do anything during the course. Those are your traditional F students. They did not show enough knowledge to continue on. So they're going to have to retake that course, whether in a classroom or on a computer uh, credit recovery program. Our NYP students, they're able to work with the teacher after the deadline, after the semester has ended, to make up those uh, gaps and uh, so they don't have to retake that class. All right. If there's not any questions, we're going to move forward. Thank you, Nate, so much. Uh, if you have the time, please stay at the table in case we have other questions. And so Mike is joining us because he also was a recipient of one of the um, House Bill 3233 funds for proficiency sites, and he is a member of this innovation lab team that went and met recently with Jennifer and her colleagues. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Mike. I, um, I am the school director of the Academy of Arts and Academics, or A3, in Springfield, Oregon. Um, I'm going to reference my comments um, a good deal about um, the Knowledge Works article I believe you all got. I wanted to reference just make it, it use that as a catalyst for what we're going to talk about. We've been open since 2006, and we have always been a proficiency uh, project-based learning school. And, um, and I would say over the years that we've, we're feeling pretty good about eight of the ten things on this list in terms of um, curriculum instruction, those, you know, having clear ideas about what it is, assessment, we have um, procedures and practices all deeply in place, uh, learning environments and so forth. Uh, we have a, a real strong community of, of learners that come from all over Lane County, so we're pretty proud of them. Um, we also have some real clear supports. Um, we have a college connection support where we pay, you know, we live pretty close to U of O and all that work at Lane Community College, so we actually pay kids tuition to go to those schools, up to eight credits a term, and uh, we have a, a new staff member recently who's uh, our college connections coordinator who doesn't just talk about the, you know, like this is how you get to, you know, the lunch place on the U of O campus or how you go meet with your professor or how to open up Blackboard, but more importantly about what are some of the social conditions that our kids come from because most of them are in, live in poverty or the first, uh, first year, they would be the first generation to go to college. So they actually sit down and talk about that in a class, in a, cl in a college classroom environment that then ramps up that support for them to be successful on the college campuses. Um, we also have really strong partnerships. Uh, right now, um, we have a J-term process where um, about 100 of our kids, we have about 350 students, so about 100 of them are indeed day-long internships at businesses all over Lane County. And I point to the success of that because um, uh, my phone hasn't rang once since I've been here about some kid doing something bad. So that's, not, that's, that's good evidence, I think, that sure, things are going pretty well. <laughs> no text messages okay, either. All right. Funny that, that it is, it's like so many uh, emails from uh, people that want to sell me stuff. Anyway, I did want to uh, take time to uh, talk a little bit about the other two elements that are on that list that I think that we need to help with. And if that's something that you all can help us out with, I'm... I'm I charge you now 
help us out with this. The first one is that I like is the comprehensive data system. Um, we envision a time where we have students that have, uh, our students do portfolios, they do portfolio presentations three times a year. However, I was unable to actually bring you one. I would have loved to have done that. I would have liked, you know, this is what our kids do, or even even show you a sample of some of their presentations. But we don't have a really strong way of archiving that. And um, I dream of a day when there is such a great e-portfolio system sponsored by the state that even, quite frankly, replaces the need for a transcript, where a kid can go online and say, I, I want to go to U of O, I want to go to PSU, since we're sitting on that campus right now. Um, I want to go to that school, and this is, I'm going to share with them this part of my portfolio that has deep outside validation, lots of, uh, lots of examples of their learning and their work, and this is how kids um, bolster their applications to colleges and for scholarships. Um, and finally, I would like to say that what clarity is there around, you know, and I, I think also that with that is well, it all helps us create a technological policy, I'll go back to that, is our tech policies right now in terms of how we're helping kids get on the internet to interface with the work um, is based on, you know, like the, about six of us get together and talk about it and we have this person from our school district that's also very hopeful, um, but I think a more articulated and, and more helpful policy of helping us do that on a statewide level would, um, would be great. But and my last point is um, one of the elements that I think has been really essential to proficiency learning and project-based learning is time to actually have sit down, solid reflection. I mean, reflection that is authentic, active, articulated, adult-aided uh, reflection for students and even for teachers, for that matter, about what, what are we doing with our time and how have, what did we really learn from this and how do we name what we learned as it's being any good? And can we take something from what we did and make it better? And how could we make it better? And can I draw something in to show I have greater evidence of it? So I don't know if you can like, give a credit for that. You know, Take away seat time a little bit just to give time kids. I, at A3, we, we spend weeks you know, having kids spend time in reflection and uh, demonstrations and representations of their work. Um, when I look at what a lot of kids are doing, you know, uh, statewide around the idea of reflection of their learning, it's like the reflection when they get to, done with some sort of summative exam or something, the reflection is, do I burn the notes or do I recycle them? <laughs> and what I'd rather see is people taking, I guess, some sort of like responsibility for that learning. And um, and then build it upon it. I am done, and I am done in less than your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move us on. Oh, just you have a, a quick, quick question. And what did you mean about a, a database for the portfolios, for example, that are actually scanning what goes into them, or? Sure. You know, I, sure. I, I think um, so many kids are creating things already online, or they're doing some of their research, or the bulk of their research online. Their products are created online, but they already exist in digital formats. Many of our kids are taking their portfolios and printing them so they can have them for their portfolio demonstrations. I envision a time where, even if it is something that's hand created and so forth, you know, a photograph from an iPhone or something where kids can then take that and they have their folders. That, I, 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 can't, I can't make the system up. All I do want to say, though, is it would be great if kids could like have archive materials. Because you know, what reflection is great for, it shows growth over time. And we deal with kids all the time in fixed mindsets about, I'm not smart. And when you can show a growth mindset of, well, you're not, you're not good at it yet. I just want to um, intercede for one second and say your thought is um, carried out by a lot of other folks. This is the fourth conversation I've had recently around why aren't we using something like LinkedIn to introduce kids to a place to upload evidence of their learning, whether it's going to take them into their careers or colleges. So that's kind of the yeah, interesting. one of the, and, and although some districts have an electronic personalized learning requirement, many of them are still using a paper pencil system. And I would just um, sort of say that maybe where we would recommend as a committee that this question or idea gets put is in the Power Up Oregon digital plan. There are 
there should be a place where we're capturing that. So as I know we've had a few conversations about how we capture that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Jim, Jim we're going to move to you. Okay. <clears throat> I'll be quick. Um, so I want to hear um, what the others have to say, and that's uh, more important. Uh, <clears throat> one quick question. On first of all, we'd be interested in uh, if you could help us, not, not now, but soon, identify those barriers that you have uh, indicate, you indicated uh, that we could take a look at and see if there's something that we can do at the state that might relieve some of those. Uh, with that in mind, uh, as some of you know, there's a, a new uh, instructional time OER uh, being proposed. Uh, in conversation with the lead staff yesterday, it appears as though the board is prepared to approve that. Uh, I met with the Washington County Assistant Superintendent uh, without uh, John from the Forest Road Museum. I think another meeting was unable to be there. Um, and we discussed what the proposal looks like. Um, and I'm not going to go through it. You have a copy of it. Uh, but the thing I want to mention about that is that as a part of that, even though it's not indicated, is that the 130-hour clock requirement is going to go away. Um, so there's some other things related to that. And, and Rob's, uh, one of his expectations or hopes is, is that the as, a, as students uh, demonstrate proficiency in one area, they, they would still be offered opportunities for additional learning, so it wouldn't be the end. So with that, let me ask, I'm not sure which of you two is going to talk about some of the barriers uh, that have resulted because of 4150, or Hospital 4150. You can do that, Nicole? I am. Okay. I'm Nicole Dalton, uh, Oregon Department of Ed. And also a member of the Innovation Lab Network team. I am, and I'm also the grant manager for the ODE um, proficiency-based teaching and learning grant, which established the five demonstration sites that are represented here. Um, so House Bill 4150 passed last year, and it changed, um, made changes to House Bill 2220, which was passed in 2011. And 2220 focused on the more um, easily identified aspects of proficiency, the grading and reporting, and it suggested that districts move towards proficiency-based teaching and learning, but didn't make it a requirement. And as a result, there were a lot of um, different ways that proficiency was implemented across the state. It led to a lot of pushback and essentially 4150. Um, so some of the, the highlights or, or the key changes um, in 4150 is that school districts are ultimately in charge of the focus and content of the grades. So they're no longer required to um, to provide parents and students with an annual report of students' achievement. So it, it does away with the grading and reporting requirements. Um, it's still an option. And if schools choose to, uh, to provide a, a, an annual report, then um, they must um, discuss with a district advisory committee if they want to use more than, than three indicators in the yearly report. Um, so again, this is only if they choose to continue providing this report to, to families. Um, proficiency is made optional. And if they do want to embrace a proficiency-based teaching and, and learning model um, or grading model, they must um, have a collaborative process that involves an advisory committee. Um, the superintendent must convene the advisory committee um, and the, the district maintains authority. So um, it's put barriers into place because we have districts who are moving towards proficiency, who with the change in legislation decided to back off. Um, from an optimistic point of view, I think it maybe gives us an opportunity to refocus and think about um, what we really want to get out of proficiency, is it just a report once a year, or is it really a change in the way that we that we teach and in the way that students learn? And so hopefully our demonstration sites, um, they, they are providing an illustration of that, of how when you embrace all of the aspects of proficiency, um, we really impact student learning. So Sorry. What, I didn't understand about doing away with reports. I mean, there must be some kind of <laughs> report to the students, your, your student, report the parents your students meeting this proficiency or something. You mean just doing away with traditional report cards or? Oh, no, no. no. There was a, 
Do you, you don't want to open that can of worms, man. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paperwork piece that is. Okay. House Bill 2220 suggests, said that you had to at least once a year have a report to parents that identified uh, the areas that are the standards that their son or daughter were proficient in, you know, for that time period. So it eliminated the behavior portion of grades. So, and it got in the way. You're right. Okay. And it got in the way, I think, of people who were far along yes. because our entire system had already gotten rid of that part. Exactly. And our whole report card was already aligned. So now we created huge confusion. So that part's good. Um, it just feels like a huge step backwards. The, uh, the option. Well, no, 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 no. The fact that we let go of the confusion. <laughs> it was definitely a step back. It, it really was because people heavily invested in it. And, uh, you know, I, it, it definitely stalled the momentum. Mm -hmm. So I hope we still get rid of the confusion but move <laughs> forward on proficiency. <laughs> it seems like a missed piece based on the fact that we're trying to create a P20 system that's yes. proficiency-based. Yeah, no Jim, maybe you can help me out with this. And I'm going to just, do I have time to ask questions? Yep, okay. go. All right. Fast. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling right now as we move forward into this session that COSA is going to come out along with a lot of other parts of the ed lobby on increased instructional time and, and longer school year and showing how our school year is shorter than like our neighbors. So this, that seems to bode we need more time, especially for kids that are struggling and a resource allocation. All day kindergarten is the first time we've really added time to what's coming. However, we also talk about proficiency as opposed to seat time. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of sending mixed messages. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, they're, they're not really different, but the message is almost against each other. And I'm concerned about that going into the session. And whether that's something we look at, we do this as a, as a, together, but we're seeing that push for more time with kids that they need it especially our vulnerable kids, we talk about the summer slippage. Then we talk about proficiency at their own rate and level. So it seems like that's where we sort of need to get our act together around a communication campaign that's about kids need more instructional time and more personalized time, but it's yes. not about seat time for credit or recognition of gaining proficiency. They're not competing against one another, no. yeah. and that's, that's where we're going to go if we don't have a common message. And it, I, I think it could be duplicated. We could do that, but also organizations that are working on this and know that the instructional time is additional is needed, but that we don't get it mixed up. It would help if we had alignment. And here's what you're up against. And Diane, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, what you're up against, no one argues proficiency. They love it, and there's almost guilt that we should be doing more of it. But if you're an individual teacher or an individual building trying to take this gorilla on, it, it doesn't sustain. After two years, fatigue sets in and gets exhausted unless there's a funding level. Yeah, unless there's and, resource. And there's, there's continuation. Okay. There has to be somehow where this is a philosophy of how we do business rather than another initiative, yes. like the Common Core. Otherwise, I can tell you which one's going to win. Yeah. I do but think, though, Mark, that the, um, the counter language to a COSA discussion is that it's not about the numbers, it's about the quality. And right now we don't have across the board the quality of time to ensure that every student is successful. And we have an opportunity and an obligation to make that happen. Which and is I a different message. It mm -hmm. is a different message. But some of the language is in that definitions page of what all of those things that make personalized learning. Uh, included with competency. Did you have any more presentation? Mr. I will share okay. Mark's comments to, to Rob, and I know he's aware of it. He's sort of stuck in the middle trying to figure out, along with mm -hmm. OEIB, mm -hmm. where, where to go. Yeah. It's I one thing that I think the state needs to have is a, is a, is a common vision of what, what yeah. should our educational system, K-20, look like. Notice I didn't have an answer, Jim. It's just a question. <laughs> but, 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 but I think Diane kind of started this conversation. Somehow, very quickly, we need to get a handle on a common message that these aren't opposing one another. Yeah. And we don't have that. We don't. And it's going to be a train wreck on how people interpret it. 
So we'll put that down as something for us to work on. Well, and actually, I'm just going to suggest, because <laughs> I know I Jennifer, <laughs> Jennifer may still be on the line, and also um, Corey's on the line, and she's actually coming up next, or right. almost next. Yes, next. Real soon, next. Um, <laughs> just think in terms of the fact that we actually have some uh, resources available to us through this national network to look at communication and messaging. Mm -hmm. So I think our ILN team is going to take your suggestion, Mark, and um, dig in deeply. So it's probably time to move to Corey. Yes. Corey, are you on? I am indeed. Thank Whoa. you so much. Um, it's fantastic to talk with you. And I know that your, your time is short. And so I will be as, um, as efficient um, as I possibly can. But thank you again so much for um, allowing us to be a part of the conversation today. So I was asked to share a little bit about some approaches that um, other states across the country are barriers that arise during implementation. Um, and I'll also tell you um, the work that we do with states is focused on what we call competency-based pathways, um, which many of our states call proficiency-based learning or mastery-based learning or competency-based education or competency-based systems or performance-based. <laughs> and um, we just try to stick to that one term so that we keep ourselves sane, but know that what we are t when we talk about competency, we mean the same thing as, as your proficiency-based learning in Oregon. Um, so I have a couple of slides. I'm going to go through them just um, really, really briefly, but try to get to the heart of the matter really fast. Um, the first is... You know, achieve, um, for those of you who haven't worked with us in the past, we're an independent, nonpartisan nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Um, we were created in 1996 by the nation's governors and business leaders, and we've really focused on working with states, um, governor's offices, state legislator, legislatures, state boards of ed, and um, state education agencies, as well as advocacy organizations and higher education to really make sure that the policy and implementation structure within states is really set up to make sure that all students um, really have a chance to reach college and career readiness by the time they graduate from high school. And we've been interested in competency-based learning really from the beginning, from 1996. Um, but only in 2012 did we really start to dig in deep. Um, and at that time, what we did is we brought together a working group of leaders from 11 states, um, as well as 12 national and, um, and state level organizations um, to really help us figure out what the key decisions are for states um, like yourselves that have been working on this for a while, but also states that are really new to this work, um, to help them figure out within assessment and accountability and graduation requirements, what are the key things that they need to address in order to make sure, one, that they actually get to the place that they have, um, that they have proficiency-based learning or competency-based pathways, um, but, but really critically, that two, that those, um, that that it looks like and functions in a way that is really geared toward getting students to a college and career ready outcome. And so we released that um, in 2013. Um, we also addressed is within that working group um, equity considerations as well as um, you know the data student performance indicators um, that can really help you figure out if um, students are making the kind of progress they need. Um, from the working group, um, which I would be incredibly remiss to um, to not point out that um, the Business Education Compact was one of the kind of leading organizations. Um, that we worked with, and Diane Smith was really helpful to us in the, um, the, the um, execution of the state policy framework and really helped us get the details right. Um, and so, um, and then in fall of 2013, after we released the framework, we actually reached out and started to work with um, a set of 12 states um, in a much more targeted way to really help them first um, really figure out their vision for advancing this work within their state, um, but then to help them meet some very clear um, milestones. Um, and we've been so pleased to be able to work with Jenny and her team at CCSSO's ILN um, with um, those states that where we overlap, which has been a really great um, leverage point for us um, as well. So within this um, partnership, 
um, we've really um, um, focused on really helping figure out what are the, the sets of milestones that states need to go through um, from both policy and implementation to make sure that at the end of the day, um, as students are going along <coughs> in their courses of study um, and being um, deemed proficient or um, competent or having achieved mastery, that those are really at a call and for any level of, of performance. And we are very excited to be working with Oregon um, as one of these states as well. Um, the next kind of major resource that I would, I would just highlight is that um, based on the work that we have been doing with states over these years, we released a policy brief um, in July 2014 where we really tried to hone in on the key recommendations for states in taking um, a real leadership responsibility in um, really making the, um, the, the vision that they have for um, advancing competency or proficiency a reality within their states and doing so with a really clear line on equity for all students. Um, and I will definitely say I was so encouraged to hear you um, in our previous conversations really hone in on the importance of communication and really having a clear rationale for advancing proficiency-based learning and how it ties in with other reform efforts. That's a really central recommendation for us and something that we've been really pleased to work with states on um, and helping them to do. Um, but to really hone in on what, um, what I was asked to present on today, um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the framework under which we think about um, the mechanisms that states use to implement um, competency-based pathways and to, I think, more precisely encourage and support school districts in implementing um, proficiency-based learning or competency-based pathways. Um, within the state policy framework that I referenced earlier, um, there is, um, and Jenny um, Poon was so kind as to foreshadow this for me, um, there is a visioning exercise where we really tried to walk the process of working with, with a broad set um, of stakeholders and a leadership team to really set the rationale for advancing competency, um, but then to really set a vision for what it would look like within the state over the next four to, four to six years. And one of the things that we really encourage is for states to figure out if they're going to, um, what they're going to do to really encourage um, districts and schools um, to make this transformation. One of the biggest um, issues that we've seen in a lot of states is that even though their policy set is very um, permissive, um, that there isn't always a lot of take up of that kind of flexibility um, to use proficiency-based learning. So I wanted to just give a couple really quickly some state examples that we've seen that have been really strong um, on ways that states have communicated the rationale, um, removed implementation barriers, um, really worked um, to facilitate learning and collaboration across districts, um, and finally to provide actual on-the-ground technical assistance and support to districts. Um, and I know the technical assistance piece is something you all have um, so much to share on as well. And so first, um, in terms of communicating the rationale and making uh, connections across reform efforts, I wanted to point you to a couple of stories. Um, the first one is in Maine. Um, Maine um, is, has a um, pretty unique policy structure in that they really require um, the use of proficiency-based diplomas starting in um, 2018, um, and so they're a little bit unique in that respect, um, but they've just done a tremendous job um, communicating why it is important to move to proficiency and how it um, fits in with the broader reform effort. And within their strategic plan, um, Education Evolving, which you can find right on the home page of their website, um, it's just very clear and easy to see how um, proficiency-based learning um, and the precise components of it actually fit into the overall strategic plan. And so on the very other end of the spectrum, um, we have Delaware. And Delaware um, actually has seat time requirements um, currently in their policy structure, um, but they are looking to um, 
make changes to that to allow for some sheet time waivers. Um, but what they've done is really brought together a, what they call the Guiding Coalition for Competency-Based Learning, where they've identified um, key um, local leaders and, and state-level stakeholders across the state to come together each month um, to really map out the rationale for why they want to move to competency-based learning, um, really bring them on board as champions and um, storytellers um, to help um, spread the movement across the state um, and to really quickly identify those implementation barriers. So one of the implementation barriers they found, which will not surprise um, those of you at districts and schools, is that um, many times student information systems are not um, really set up to, to do the kind of um, grading and reporting um, that is so fantastic and transparent within these systems. And so just as an example of something the state of Delaware has done, um, they've really used their, their influence to meet with um, the vendor of the most common SIS package um, to really convince them to um, make some new modules that would allow for more, much more proficiency-based grading. <laughs> um, another story is from Colorado. Colorado um, has decided that they do not have much um, policy levers at the state level in terms of really encouraging competency-based learning. So what they have done is really brought together a group of interested districts um, to work in a study group to explore how this all works together and has really built a lot of momentum through that effort. Um, and one of the things they've done is really learned about the perceived barriers in state policy and have really been able to clear up a lot of misconceptions where districts felt like they couldn't do things, um, but they've really been able to show how um, in, um, it is possible within, within statute. And finally, um, I just wanted to share one of the, the biggest um, implementation barriers that we have seen across states is that in many times parents um, parents often get concerned that the kind of scripts that students um, leave school with in high school will somehow disadvantage them in the process of being a student and, um, and placed at, in the college level. And so Maine and a number of other New England states have worked together to really um, have the colleges and universities in that area really sign on to signal support for these types of transcripts. Corey, yes. you've been fantastic in highlighting some of these examples. We're just looking Sorry, at... I know I'm running short. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a couple of others, but let me just send them to you by email, and so maybe um, that will show some of the links that are available. Um, and one of the suggestions that we're uh, thinking about here is to um, have the ILN team and any other people who are here today that are interested in participating and actually get a conference call with our um, ILN partners and our Achieve partners and actually walk through what steps we might be able to do so that we can bring back a plan to the best practices subcommittee. I'm not going to promise that it will be on the February agenda, but how about we aim for March? Does that Sounds sound like a plan? Sounds great. Corey, thanks so much. Thank you for the suggestion because we do need to move forward. And Sarah, I know you've agreed to come back next time, but to do just a short video right now. I think it might answer some questions that have emerged. Thank you. Or offer an answer. Boy, we pack a lot into these meetings. Who organizes them? <laughs> <laughs> Ignacio Estrada said, if a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. Who knows who Ignacio Estrada is, but his words are prophetic. Because in five years, classrooms themselves will learn about each student that personalize coursework accordingly. Today, nearly two out of every three adults worldwide have not achieved the equivalent of a high school education. Of course, teachers do teach the individual student needs as much as they can in a class that might have 30 kids. But soon, with the help of cloud-based learning systems, teachers' efforts will go much further. Imagine a system that knows you're a visual learner with a math phobia. Imagine also that you are that person. 
Not only will the classroom create a lesson plan to help you master algebra, it'll preempt difficulties in calculus and even tailor coursework toward a specific career, maybe even one that involves math. With time, teachers will be able to reach more students in more meaningful ways. And with students learning at their own pace, we'll move beyond grades, credits, and syllabi. I love it when I have the chance to say syllabi. It's the end of the era of one-size-fits-all education and the beginning of personalized experiential learning. And isn't learning what education's all about? All right, thank you very much for offering that up. Thank you for, to all of you and to uh, Hilda for organizing all of you here. We always wish we had more conversation, but appreciate your points. And when you come back, please remember that we're about uh, addressing those barriers in the transitions. So the more we can continue to point together to those barriers would be helpful to us. We do have uh, three people up for public comment. We typically allow three minutes. I'm going to ask you to try to definitely at three minutes, I'm going to ask Seth to help me cut you off. If you can reduce it to two minutes, that would be wonderful because in half an hour we have another meeting that we all have to be a part of. Thank you, presenters. Thank you. Mary Whitmore, uh, well, you're coming up to do your couple of minutes, I hope. Yes. Uh, I want to point out that we received um, a handout as that is to be included as public testimony that says exclusive Google CIA investment and future of web monitoring. So I want to point the committee to that. And now, Mary, it's your turn. Seth, will you time us? Hello, uh, my name is Mary Whitmore, and I'm a retired teacher from Forest Grove. Um, I've made it a habit to come to a lot of OEI meetings and a lot of Forest Grove School Board meetings um, because I'm dedic I dedicated my retirement to helping all American children benefit from explicit phonics. Um, best practices, could you just give me a one-liner on that de definition for best practices? Actually, we don't respond to in public comments, okay. so um, I can have Hilda follow up with that. Okay, I'm kind of assuming it's what works for kids, and that uh, the way we measure what works for kids is our assessments, which have been oaks and are now going to be smart and balanced. Um, I'd like to uh, also confirm my understanding that um, there's a 70% literacy rate in Oregon schools right now. I think that's the last Oaks uh, figure. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, schools using explicit phonics over the last 10 years that have averaged over 90% literacy in their schools. 90%. And that is... Cascade Heights in Clackamas, Cascade Heights Public Charter School, and also Mitch Charter School in Tigard. And I would like to invite you along, uh, well, Dr. Dapo, who's going to um, give a statement, he and I would like to invite any of you to tour one of those two schools to see how they teach reading because they've obviously got it right. Um, if you can't visit those schools, I'd like this committee to invite uh, the principal of the schools to come and do a presentation so you'll know more about explicit phonics and why it works so well. Um, <clears throat> our legislature is currently considering LC384, which uh, would establish an explicit phonics platform and bring materials into schools. It basically recreates ORS 337.275, which was in effect from 1999 to 2012. And I'm hoping that um, that platform can be reestablished so our ex superintendents can have um, a good basis for bringing explicit phonics into school. That's it. Thank you very much. Jim Anderson? And Dr. Dapo, you'll be up right after that. Hi, I'm Jim Anderson, PTA King School, and also uh, chair of Operation Easy Tutoring. And uh, 
I want to compliment you on your emphasis on uh, uh, teaching to uh, uh, proficiency. And uh, this isn't being done uh, where I've experienced it. The, uh, uh, the point you make about uh, differentiating support depending upon the student, I think is so important. Uh, the uh, information that uh, uh, has been gotten by early education shows such a drastic difference in kindergarten between uh, African Americans and Hispanic compared to white students. This is, uh, is going to require a huge amount of difference. Uh, I see it kind of as a, uh, a hospital where you have people come in on an emergency basis because they're in desperate need and they need uh, more resources of the school. Uh, we tried to do that back in the 60s with uh, uh, with uh, the war on poverty uh, in Title I, and uh, I actually was in Washington County auditing that and found that uh, still is today that fund, those funds do not go to help the people who are far behind, but they go to the general fund and usually benefit the advanced students more than they do the people who it was uh, designed to help. But uh, I uh, thank you for your work. Thank you. Dr. Dapple? I still don't know your specific assignment. You heard Tamara Bush Johnson this morning. Laid out very well here. Uh, Jennifer Boone graphically what has happened to us everywhere everywhere but we are feeling we're not getting there we are not getting there we fail and fail and fail and i'm afraid i'm not a negative person i deal with what i'm going to talk about but i don't hear us talking about joy in the education joy in the education Jennifer, I mean Hilda, she went like this. Well, if we can find somebody to facilitate, isn't that be good? Someone to put all this together and just hand it over to us. Do it like this. Is that possible? Do we have that mind? Because we all, we are going like this. And, and we mean well. I read a Tamra thesis, incredibly. Information there, convicted. I don't know. I don't do this, though, because I was told if I do that, the rest are pointing back at me. So, because I'm in the package, I'm talking to Dapo. Oh, yeah, I'm there. But are we going, I bet, do we really want to do something, though? I am scared to death. Not, not, not physically, fear. Do you know education is what is causing the problem in Paris? Those young men, it's education. Ferguson, education. Everywhere, education. We've got to be educated. Education is what brought you here this morning, yeah. He had to drive, Mark had to drive about four miles. I don't know whether he drove four miles this morning to get here. That was just a part. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to be spending the night here. Yeah. Education. <coughs> Education. Education. Kate Turan was late. I know why she's late. She had to have a staff meeting this morning. She didn't tell me that. Got to talk to some folks. What to do, how to do with each other. <coughs> I don't know. We need to come to something tangible. Because I, oh, well, I got the joy. I know where it come from, but we need that joy to be displaced in the classroom, at your work, everywhere. Joy. 
the case to be. This is America. For kids to be in the classroom, to, to feel good. I mean, America. There is enough of them in there, but they're feeling. One of them, you know what he did? He dressed, he dressed up in a military uniform and went to the classroom. What was he doing? Killing his classmates in America. Oh, we, we've got to think. Oh, yeah. It is a serious business, and I'm, I'm in the package. I can't do this. I am part of it, too. Thank you. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, all of you who are joining us, and we'll be starting OEIB at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Adjourn us.